Okay, well, welcome everyone to the first presentation in the Martha Blakeney Hodges Special Collection and University Archives 50th Anniversary Speaker Series. We're very proud um, that this first talk is by none other than our own Beth Ann Kelsch. Beth Ann is an associate professor at UNCG and has been the curator of the Betty H. Carter Women Veterans Historical Project since 2008. Kelsch previously worked as a project archivist at the um, Sally Bingham Center for Women's History and Culture at Duke University. She earned her master's in library science degree from the School of Information and Library Science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2007, and her undergraduate degree from Duke University in 1980, 19, I'm sorry, 1990. I'm delighted to introduce Beth Ann Kelsch. Also, I wanted to say if you have any questions, please type them in the chat and we will get to them at the end. Beth Ann, take it away. Okay, thank you. I am sharing my screen. Let's hope this goes better. Share. Excellent. We can see my little PowerPoint. Okay, so thank you again for joining us today. Um, today, we're going to do two different things. I'm going to first give a brief historical interview overview, not an interview, interviews are later, a brief historical overview of the history of African American women in the United States military. And then I'm going to share stories um, from oral histories of some of the black women that are part of the collection, their stories are part of the collection. So um, let's begin. So American women um, all have participated in the defense of this nation in both war and peacetime uh, since the founding of the United States. And that also, that includes black women. So while all women in the US armed forces share a history of discrimination based on gender, black women have faced both race, racial and gender discrimination. So even before black women were given a permanent status in the United States military in the 20th century, mid 20th century, they did serve their country. Here are three examples. Uh, first one on the left there is Harriet Tubman, who I hope everyone knows um, in terms of Underground Railroad. Uh, but she also served with Union forces in the Civil War. She was born into slavery in Maryland in 1822. She escaped to freedom in the North in 1849. And during the Civil War, she worked for the Union Army um, as a nurse, as a cook, but also as a spy. Her experience leading enslaved people along the Underground Railroad was especially helpful um, to the Union Army because she was knowledgeable about the local geography. Uh, Tubman recruited a group of formerly enslaved people to hunt for rebel camps and then report on the movement to the Union troops. In 1863, she went with Colonel James Montgomery and about 150 black soldiers on a gunboat raid in South Carolina. Because she had information that she got from her scouts, uh, the Union gunboats were able to surprise the Confederates. Uh, she earned the nickname General Tubman from soldiers. The second image is Cathay Williams. She was born to an enslaved mother and a free father in Independence, Missouri in 1844. In 1866, she enlisted in the United States Regular Army under the false name of William Cathay. She enlisted for a three-year engagement and you know, passed herself off as a man. This worked for a couple of years, um, but she was hospitalized and the military post surgeon discovered that she was a woman and informed the commander. Cathay was, um, or Williams was honorably discharged by her commanding officer in October, 1868. Although this discharge meant the end of her tenure with the army, Williams then later signed up again, posting as William Cathay with an emerging all black regiment that would eventually become part of the legendary Buffalo Soldiers who were African-American soldiers who served mainly in the Western frontier uh, in the years after the American Civil War. And in the third picture, we're gonna move up to World War I. At the outset of the US entry into World War I, there were many uh, trained black nurses enrolled in the American Red Cross and they um, enrolled with the hope to gain entry into the Army or Navy Nurse Corps. 
as the war escalated, there was public pressure um, and that increased to allow black women to serve in these corps. Finally, shortly after the end of the war in November 1918, um, 18 black Red Cross nurses were offered Army Nurse Corps assignments. Uh, these women were assigned to Camp Grant in Illinois and Camp Sherman in Ohio. And they uh, had to live in segregated uh, quarters and in, um, you know, they were allowed to care for black soldiers and German prisoners of war. The armistice halted plans for adding more black nurses to the military. And by August 1919, all black nurses had been released from service as the nursing corps were reduced to their peacetime levels. So that's the way it was until we get to World War II, where um, it's a huge war. The United States is fighting on, um, in, in Europe and in Asia. And when, when there's need, suddenly um, gender and um, race prohibitions will, will tend to uh, fall. So in January 1941, before we were involved in the war, the U.S. Army opened its nurse corps to African American women, but with a ceiling of 56. I don't know where they got that number from. The quota for Black Army nurses was finally eliminated in July 1944. By the end of the war, uh, approximately 500 African American nurses held commissions, compared to 59,000 white nurses. The Navy Nurse Corps finally dropped its color ban on January 25th, 1945. And uh, history here, March 9th, a woman named Phyllis Daly became the first black commissioned Navy nurse. Black women were also um, permitted to enlist in the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, which the Corps is um, soon converted within the year to the Women's Army Corps, became an officially part of the US Army. Um, it wasn't until a few years later that they were allowed to join the Navy waves and the Coast Guard spars, the Women Marines Reserve, nor the uh, Women Air Force Service pilots um, allowed any Black women to serve during the war. So back to the Army, which, um, you know, had the most uh, Black women. So from 1942, um, when the first WAC officers arrived, um, in Fort Des Moines in Iowa, out of those women, there were 40, 400 white women and 40 black women. And that number is key because the rules meant um, there was a quota and they were called the 10 percenters because there, the quota was you could not have more um, than 10% of black women um, being part of any, um, you know, part of the WAC. So, and the reason it was 10% is that was the um, match the black population of the entire United States. So enlisted women um, served in segregated units. They participated in segregated training. They lived in separate quarters. They ate at separate tables in the mess halls and they used uh, segregated recreation facilities. Officers received their officer candidate training in integrated units, but then lived under segregated conditions. So during the war, um, about 6,500 6, black women served in the WAC out of about, actually, I don't know the WAC number, but you know, many hundreds of thousands served um, in the army. So as I had mentioned, black women were barred from the Navy waves until October, 1944. And that only changed because of the efforts of the director of the Navy Waves, Mildred McAfee, and Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. Um, they got together uh, along with the Secretary of the Navy and pushed through um, the change. So the first two Black wave, Waves officers were Harriet Ida Pickens and Francis Wills, and they were sworn in on December 22nd, 1944. Of the 80,000 waves who served in the war, there were a total of 72 black women who um, were waves. The Coast Guard also opened um, their uh, ranks to black women on October 20th, um, 1944, but there were very few women, uh, black women spars. And I'd mentioned that the um, WASP and the Marines um, remained segregated. 
So war's over, we move on in time. So following the war, um, racial and gender discrimination as and segregation continued. For example, because of the entry, the quotas I'd mentioned and also segregation in the WAC, that deterred many black women from uh, re-enlisting. Um, so by June, 1948, there were only four black women officers and 121 enlisted women in the entire Women Army Corps. However, in 1948, a big year, President Harry S. Truman signed two, uh, two things that are important. First of all, the Women's Armed Services Integration Act, which made um, with some complicated provisions, which I won't go into, but it made women uh, officially part, a permanent part of the US military. And also in 1948, he signed Executive Order 9981, and that officially desegregated the United States Armed Forces. So as the years went on, um, new opportunities came up for you know, Black women, all women. During the Korean and Vietnam Wars in the 1950s, 60s, and early 1970s, Black women took their places um, stateside and in the war zones along with um, all other members of the armed forces. And the woman on the uh, left, that's an army nurse, it's Clara Adams Ender. And I don't, we don't have the name of the woman on the right, but she is a uh, Women's Army Corps in Vietnam. And going back here, the women on the left, we don't have names, but they're Women's Army Corps. And also unnamed, but I love this picture of a woman who's in the Army Nurse Corps in World War II. Okay, so moving to the 1970s through the 90s, um, both the drive, sort of the women's, um, you know, equality movement, women's liberation movement, and also the United States ended the draft. So the military had to convert to an all volunteer. So, um, you know, because they couldn't get any man that they wanted at any time, um, women's roles um, were expanded. So there was a major overhaul of the service laws, regulations, and women were integrated more into the military. The branches, each branch began to examine and sort of change their policies and move towards greater um, equality, recruiting, assignments, promotions, and family policies. For example, it used to be if you were pregnant, you had to leave. Didn't, didn't matter. You could be a colonel, you know, and married, you had to leave the military. So starting 1976, Women were integrated into commissioning programs and training courses and service academies, you know, Annapolis, West Point. Weapons training became mandatory, it didn't used to be. And the only fields that were close to them were combat and um, things that were considered beyond the physical abilities of most women, those were closed. So by the end of the 1970s, women no longer, you know, the separate corps were disbanded and just women were rolled into, you know, each of the branches. Um, so by the end of the 1980s, women were 11% of total military personnel and, you know, women of all races served in that decade's military conflicts, uh, Grenada, Libya, Panama. Um, and then we get to 1991, Operation Desert Storm, which was in Kuwait and Iraq. Uh, Black women and, and all, you know, all women, uh, they served in officers, non-commissioned officers and enlisted. So I did a little research and of the 35,000 women who served um, in Iraq and Kuwait in Desert Storm, Desert Storm an estimated 40% of those women were black. All right, moving on to this century. So <clears throat> um, in the war on terror, um, more than 300,000 women have served deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan since 9-11. Uh, women now make up 16% of today's military, but you know that's total. Um, in the Air Force and the Navy, they actually make up to 20% of their force, and the Marine Corps, um, not surprisingly to me, it's only 9%. And as of 2019, which were the most recent data I could find, about 30% of these women, of the total number of women, of active enlisted women um, were black, as were 14% of the officers. Okay, in 2015, Defense Secretary at the time, Ash Carter, announced that all military operations and positions would be open to women. For the first time in the United States military history, as long as a woman qualified and met specific standards, 
uh, Ash Carter said that women will be able to contribute to the Defense Department mission with no barriers at, barriers at all in their way. Now, in practice, the implementation of these changes a little bit has been a little bit more complicated, but I just want to say that military culture is always evolving, and uh, there we go. So I want to just end this section, uh, this brief history, with the words of Major Charity Adams Early. Um, there she is there. And she was the commander of the 6 6888 Central Postal Directory Battalion. This is World War II. These women were the first um, non-nurses, the first Black um, Army uh, battalion to serve overseas. So she wrote in 1989, she summarized the history of uh, women in the military. This is what she wrote, quote, the future of women in the military seems assured. What may be lost in time is the story of how it happened. The barriers of sex and race were and sometimes still and I don't have that page. Such an inspirational speech. Let me find that. Hold, please. Well, I was doing so well with that majorly inspirational speech. And where did it go? Nope. Okay. I'm going to, we're going to hold on. And I'm going to stop the script. I'm going to go back to here. And I do not want to miss these words here. Okay, Charity Adams, there we go. Um, the future of the women in the military seems assured. What may be lost in time is the story of how it happened. The barriers of sex and race were, and sometimes still are, very difficult to overcome. The second of these, even more than the first. During World War II, women in the service were often subject to ridicule and disrespect, even as they performed satisfactorily. Each year, the number of women who shared the stress of these accomplishments lessens. In another generation, young Black women who joined the military will have scant record of their predecessors who fought on the two fronts of discrimination, segregation and reluctant acceptance by males. So that was uh, her quote. And I chose that at the risk of kind of sounding hokey, I do want to say that as curator of the Women Veterans Historical Project, I am working to make sure, um, you know, that uh, Major Adams, Early Adams prediction does not come true. Okay, so now I'm going to share the stories of, and hopefully I have all that information, don't have to do this, of some of the Black women who have contributed their oral histories to the Women Veterans Historical Project. So the first woman I want to talk woman I want to talk about is Millie Dunvisi. Uh, she was actually part of that six AAA Central Postal Battalion I had just mentioned. Uh, she served in the Women's Army Corps um, for two years in World War II. So uh, Ms. Vizi was born in Raleigh in 1918, and she attended Washington High School there in Raleigh. Worked for the Wake County Extension Agent. Um, and then enlisted in the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps in December of 1942. She went to Fort Devers, Colorado for basic training, was stationed then at Fort Clark, Texas. She was a clerk for the Cooks and Baker School until the spring of 1944. Um, and uh, so she was assigned to the 6888 um, and she was the company clerk there. And first they were assigned to Birmingham, England. And what they did was um, there's a huge backlog of mail and um, you know they did a great job sort of getting it to where they were going. So she was the company clerk. And then um, after they finished in Birmingham, the six triple eights moved to Rouen, France in the summer of 1945. And she worked as the supply clerk there. Um, so in her 2000 oral history, we asked why she joined the army. She said, I think it was because my brother was in the army. However, he did not care for me to come into the army. Uh, Vizi um, 
said that she felt um, that people in general, civilians were not in favor of women joining the military. It was just a taboo maybe in the black community, she said. However, another, another thing I guess that I would say now that I didn't think I was going in to free a man to go overseas, which was you know, sort of the you know, reasoning for why women should be able to join to free a man to go overseas or to free one for combat duty. Back to Ms. Vizi's words here. Um, I did feel though that if the army was selecting women and there were black soldiers in the army, then why not black women in the army? It's the end of that section. She, uh, VZ remembered this about her very first day in the army. We asked that question of what you remember. She said it was pouring down rain. And I said, well, you know, after Reveille, it's it's just raining. We can't possibly be going out today. And she was told, quote, it does not rain in the army. It rains on the army. Um, we also asked her if she ever recalled being afraid during the military. And she talked about um, when she was in England, you know, they had to work, the Germans were doing buzz bombing. Um, and uh, you quote, you could hear it from afar, but we were close enough that we had to go into the bomb shelters. All right, the second woman I would like to talk about is Maddie Donald Hicks. She served in the Army Nurse Corps from 1945 all the way to 1966. She was born in 1914 and raised in Greensboro. She graduated from Dudley High School and entered nurses training at Grady Hospital School of Nursing in Atlanta. She also completed graduate courses in public health in Richmond, Virginia and Charlotte, North Carolina. So um, Ms. Hicks joined the Army Nurse Corps in July, 1945. She did her three weeks of officer's training and this with, with a racially integrated unit at Camp McCoy in Wisconsin. So then she was shipped to the General Army Hospital at Camp St. San Luis Obispo in California. And she became a member of the African-American nurse uh, hospital unit that treated German POWs, which was something that uh, the army was not really keen on allowing black women to treat anyone but POWs or um, other black um, or black soldiers. So she was released from the army um, following um, the end of the war in August 1945, but they asked her if she wanted to join back again after the war. And so she did in March 1946. From 1951 to 1953, Ms. Hicks served at the 11th Evacuation Hospital in Korea and later at the Osaka Hospital in Japan. She also served uh, additional duty stations, including Letterman Army Hospital in San Francisco, the Second Field Hospital in Germany, U.S. Hospital at Bremerhaven, Germany, also Germany too, the Womack Army Hospital at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. She retired in 1966 as a major after 21 years of service. So in her 1999 oral history interview, she was asked about her time at the 11th EVAC hospital um, in Korea during the Korean War. Quote, in Korea, they were pretty well bombed out and some people didn't have a place to stay and no food, all that kind of thing. We tried to, out, we tried to help out as much as possible. Um, the Koreans would come by, the civilians, and they'd get food that was left over from the meals that we would serve. Their homes were blown away, and some of them didn't have clothing fit to wear and all that. So it was something. You know, I said, I don't know what the people in America would do if they had to go through some of the things that you would see in the war. Uh, another question we asked is when the army, you know, became integrated, which happened during her time, did, did she recall any specific problems? And her reply was, no, we didn't see any problem. Because you know, when you're afraid, as most of us were, being in a theater of war where they were fighting and all that, you kind of act like family. Uh, later on, she also discussed sort of the hardest part of nursing, quote, it kind of gets to you, but we had to play nurse, we had to play mama, because some of the soldiers were just right out of high school and they didn't know too much about army life. And we had to play preacher, we had to play friend. Sometimes if somebody would die in the night and the doctor wasn't around, you had to baptize them before you sent them, before they died and you sent them to the morgue. You'd sprinkle and say, uh, 
because you didn't want to send them to the morgue without them being baptized, even though they might not even be your faith. But if a soldier had asked, you did it, and then you would wrap them up and send them to the morgue. This is Leela Hamilton. Um, she was in the Women in the Air Force from 1951 and 1955. She was trained as an air traffic controller. Uh, the photo on the right, she actually was um, kind of a mess hall supervisor in Germany, which uh, you can learn about in the uh, oral history if you'd like to read it. But so she was an officer. Uh, she was born in 1926 in Brooks County, Georgia. After officer's training, she was stationed at Fort McCord Air Base in Tacoma, Washington, and the uh, Spangdalm Air Force Base in Spangdalm, Germany. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And the US Air Force headquarters in Romstein, Ger Romstein Germany, and the Wheelis Air Force Base in Tripoli, Libya, and then back to Syracuse, New York. She retired in 1955 as a first lieutenant. I was actually the one that interviewed her in 2010. I went to the Cedars Retirement Community in Chapel Hill. So one of the questions that we ask is uh, what did family and also friends feel about um, you joining the military? And Ms. Hamilton replied, my mother did not know. I told her I was getting a government job. And I interrupted with like, well, that's not a lie. And she said, well, that's stretching it. It's quibbling. Uh, the reason she you know, stayed so vague was um, that because of the fact that all women in the service at that time were considered bad. Now, uh, when Miss Hamilton joined, her goal was to become a trained dietitian. And um, this is what she talked about. Quote, and they said, I didn't have enough of quantitative cookery and that kind of stuff. So I had to get an officer commission first. And then after I was commissioned, they would send me to Purdue University to get a dietitian degree. Well, that didn't happen. The Air Force had a need, which was not what I wanted. They had a need for women to become air traffic controllers. This was the first time they were integrating women into a male's predominant field. Later on in the interview, she talked about how she dealt with the discrimination she encountered for both her race and her sex. Um, first time she was talking about officers training school and how she dealt with it. She said, I had, I had determination. I've been living in the South where I learned how to live with people who did not like me because of my color. I was determined I was not going to let whatever happen when I was going through officer candidate school to become a black issue but to be an issue that if I personally did not do something right, but even though it, it, you know, at times, sometimes it was a racial issue. She also mentioned that there were other black women that came in with her um, in her officer training class, but she was the only black woman to make it through uh, and graduate from the program. Uh, she talked about her um, time at Lackland in San Antonio and explained how um, you know, the black and male and the female officers were segregated from um, the white officers when it came to socializing off base because the military was integrated, but the rest of the country wasn't. So quote, when we got commissioned, we could not go to the party, the after party afterwards because it was off base. They, um, the other, I guess, rest of the Air Force administration officers suggested subtly because it was downtown off base in one of the large clubs. So the black officers that were army and, and you know, some were Air Force invited us to come to their club. Um, there weren't that many blacks that graduated with my class and I was, was the only woman. Okay, moving on to General Adams Ender. Uh, Clara Adams Ender, she served in the Army Nurse Corps from 1961 to 1993. She was born in Willow Springs, North Carolina in 1939. She was the fourth of 10 children. She was raised on a tobacco farm, which was in Wake County. Her father was a sharecropper. Uh, Adams Ender graduated from um, high school at the age of 16, and then she began attending North Carolina A&T State University down the road here in Greensboro, 
and she actually did, um, and she talks about this in her oral history, participate in the famous famous Woolworths sit-in protest that began in um, February 1st, 1960. While at college, she entered the Army nurse, uh, Army's student nurse program to help pay her for her final two years of nursing school. And upon graduation in 1961, she was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Army Nurse Corps. She had a very long career, um, but some of the thing, uh, highlights I want to talk about, she was assigned overseas beginning in 1963 as a staff nurse for the 121st evacuation hospital near North Korea. So as I'd mentioned, she served as an officer, nurses are officers, um, from 1961 and 1993. And she rose to the rank of Brigadier General in 1987. She, she was the chief of the Army Nurse Corps from 1987 to 1991. Um, and then, until she retired in 1993 as the commanding general of Fort Belver in Virginia, where she was the first army nurse and the first African-American woman ever to command a major army base. Adam Zender retired in 1993, and it's probably not the highlight of her career, but in 2009, she was the keynote speaker at the annual Women Veterans um, Luncheon that we hold here. So in that photo um, on the right, um, from left to right, that is um, first um, Adams Ender's husband, um, and then um, Colin Powell's wife, and then Adams Ender, and then Colin Powell. So, in her 2005 oral history interview she did with us, let me check the time. Okay, um, she discusses what discussed what happened when she was promoted to chief nurse of the 97th General Hospital in Frankfurt, Germany, in the 1980s. Quote: This is a long story. The male commander of the hospital summoned her to his office when she started. At their meeting, she asked, "Sir, I just have one question for you. Why did you select me?" to be the chief nurse here, because she had been the assistant chief. He said, well, I have a couple of reasons for doing that. One was I've seen you go around here and do your thing as the assistant chief nurse, and I like your style. He said, you're very knowledgeable and you take care of the troops. And you know, that's what, uh, is, that's what it is you're supposed to be about. So far, so good. He continued, but I want you to remember two things, one, he said, you need to understand that I, as a white person, know about you and all of you as African-Americans, he said, as black people in America. And you need to know that no matter how smart you get, we are always smarter. And again, I'm con you know, this is from Adam Zender. So I kind of leaned over and I said, oh, I want to hear some more of this. So he continued. And the second thing you need to remember is that the physician, which he was as commander, is always right in all circumstances, it doesn't matter. So as long as you don't forget those things, that will help in our relationship. Because if you're having a situation and anything happens, I'm a physician, so I'll always be right. And again, this is back, you know, this continuing on. And you know, I kind of sat there because I felt that I had come a long way because I have seen the times that when he would have spoken to me in that fashion without me telling him about what I really thought of him. But I said to him then, or you know, now, I said, you know, sir, I'm feeling really proud of myself right now because I'm sitting here and I'm listening to you say what you're saying. And you know, I don't feel any anger towards you or anything else because I know what the real truth is. You said that you as a white person know black folks I want to tell you, I bet I know a whole lot more about you than you know about me, because I've had to know more about you than you know about me. I said, I want you to remember what you said here, because I will tell you this, every chance, every opportunity that I have at this facility, I'll put you out front, because that's where you're supposed to be, because you're the commander. And I want the people to know here that I support you as the commander. But let me tell you this. If you ever slip and let anyone get the idea that you feel about me as you have just relayed to me, I'll slap a class action suit on you so fast it'll make your head swim. In relation to your second thing for me to remember, 
about the uh, doctors are always right. I won't even grace that with a comment. I then got myself up, walked right out and went on to my business, you see, because there was nobody there but me and him. Now, what's he gonna do? What's he gonna do? Say, Clara was insubordinate. He can't say that, there was just me and him there. And I would have said, if that had happened, who, me, insubordinate? Do you all think I'm crazy enough to be insubordinate? I just got picked below the zone for full colonel. And the commander never said a word about it. And I never repeated it again, but I put him out and I put him out in front any opportunity that I got so he could show and he never slipped. He never let anyone see it because I learned years ago, you cannot change people's attitude. You can't, but you can switch up their behavior and that's all I care. All I care is that your behavior changes and his behavior did not reflect what it was he told me out of his mouth. Oh, it was very interesting. That is General Claire. All right, and my last one here, uh, this is Sarah Charles. She served in the National Guard and the US Army from 81 to 2011. And uh, she's from 2007, and these are photos from there, from 2009, she was deployed to uh, Kuwait with the one, uh, 149th Transportation Company. Uh, and then also from 2009 to 2010, she was deployed to Iraq with the 82nd Cavalry Regiment. Charles was born in 1958 in St. Croix, the U.S. Virgin Islands. In her 2019 oral history interview, she explained that she wanted to join the Army after seeing the Be All You Can Be, the Army recruiting television commercial and thinking that enlisting would be a good decision because she was in a very bad marriage at the time. But she also had four children at the time. So uh, she was only eligible to join the Army Reserve or the National Guard. So she joined the National Guard. She requested a food service job because she wanted to learn to be a cook. And so she did that until she was deployed. As you see, she's driving trucks there. But she felt that the, um, you know, this is the early 1980s, that the male soldiers treated the women as if they were, quote unquote, below them. So when she was called up to active duty, um, again, to serve a deployment in Iraq, she drove trucks. She also suffered a TBI, which is a traumatic brain injury, from an IED explosion. And she's actually still dealing with the health effects of that injury. One of the things that women have to deal with during the deployment, um, you know, and else, everywhere else in society is sexual har um, harassment and assault. Charles manages manage the situation by, as she said, quote, I always carried a knife by my side because you come and mess with me. I'm stabbing you because I'm making darn sure you're not going to rape me. That so, uh, yeah, that, that didn't happen to her. Um, she also counseled younger female soldiers um, to not date other soldiers while they were on deployment and instead to focus on their mission. I chose to end this lecture with Sarah Charles's oral history because of the way she answered one of the questions we ask on during every interview. This is near the end of the questions. We ask, some people describe women in the service as trailblazers. Do you feel that way? She answered, yeah, because we made a way for other people that, um, that come behind us to follow. World War I, World War II females, they weren't in combat, but they were still veterans. They were doing nursing and stuff like that. They made a way for us. So now we are making a way so that younger women could follow us and go on. That's how I look at it. Because somebody was a trailblazer for me because I watched them and I'm like, oh, they got it. But I didn't expect to become a combat veteran. I expected to be a veteran, but not a combat veteran. I'm making that trailblazing thing for somebody else to follow me. So that's the end. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions, I will do my best to answer them. Um, so. Thank you so much, Beth Ann. Sure. Great presentation. Thanks, especially if I had printed out that one last page. But. Are there any questions? You can either turn your microphone if we can allow that, Patrick, or you can put your questions in chat. 
Beth Ann. I had a question. You um, did, Sean. Yeah, great presentation. Um, so one of the questions I was curious about was, uh, what is one of your most memorable uh, oral history interview experiences that you had related to this kind of topic? Okay. Um, I would have to say uh, Major Fannie Lou McClendon and why. So <clears throat> our oral history, the we kind of focus on you know local history you if they have any uncg connections or you know we go to their to veterans houses and interview them there um and then of course now we're doing a little bit you know we're doing them all via zoom so for example i just interviewed a woman who lived in florida but before the covid happened um i realized that the history of the um six triplets the black women in the women's army corps it was just really important history and these women were were quite elderly so uh there's a gentleman called carlton philpot one of the best names and um he is a retired military and he does a lot now to preserve um, black military history so he turned me on to the existence of uh major mcclendon and she so i flew to phoenix in july I do not recommend that if you could go to not go to Phoenix in July, definitely don't go. Uh, the reason I went is because she was one of the very few surviving officers who served with the six triple H. She was 99 years old at the time. Um, she's still living alone, kind of uh, bossing her nephew around there. And then she insisted on taking me to lunch. So um, we had Mexican food and margaritas with uh, Major McClendon. So. I'd say that's one of my most memorable. Thanks, Beth Ann. Any, any other questions? Yes. Um, I've really enjoyed all of these stories, and you've mentioned several um, oral histories. How would I go about accessing your collections? Well, good question here. So let's see. Um, if you, we have a lot on our website. Can you see? um the different screen now the thing can you put the link to your website in the chat sure thanks patrick well that's easy enough go here <laughs> i mean there are a lot of things that are not we try to digitize as much as possible um you know here's a 1949 women's uh, air force photograph album um so you know, we have a lot of visuals. That's the beginning of the album. We don't necessarily need to page through, but trust me. Um, let's just quickly go to eight, see what happens. There we go. So um, a lot of materials like that. And here's our general, because she's A. And so photos of her, um, you know, we do oral history transcripts. If we do diaries, things like that. So that is how you access it. Beth Ann, um, how, how do you how do you find women to to interview for your collections? Good question. It really varies. Um, I mean, it, we started started out as a project way back in the late '90s. It was pretty much, um, you know our very first oral history interview was the interviewer's um, bridge partner um, was Grace Alexander. She was in the Navy waves World War II. And once uh, Herman interviewed her, she kind of told all of her other waves uh, veteran buddies. So now luckily we have um, been doing this for a while. So not as well known as we want, but you know, we have an established presence. So if I say, Hey, um, you know, would you be interested in participating in this project? They can see that um, we're not this fly-by-night organization. So um, there are, again, word of mouth is still important. Uh, go out and do, um, you know, public events and um, and ask for any women veterans there to if they're interested to sign up. So it'll be you know, talks, presentation, community presentations, also the annual Women Veterans Luncheon. Uh, people refer veterans to me. 
So it's it's really a, a variety of ways. Great, thank you. And it looks like Stacy Krim has a question. Hi, Beth Ann. Um, do you think racial discrimination or gender and sexual discrimination is the greater challenge for women in the US military? Hmm. Well, it's kind of hard to untangle discrimination, um, but I think it's evolved. Um, I think when, <clears throat> you know, World War II and up through maybe the 80s or 90s, it was kind of, well, certainly through our World War II up through the 50s, definitely was, I would say, both and be equal because you know you know there's a lot of segregation you know segregation prejudice and also you know women weren't supposed to be in the military so as the decades have gone on i mean until recently i still feel i mean i'm not gonna presume to say um you know what discrimination has lightened but just from reading my research and oral history interviews i think today, just because there are, you know, as I mentioned, 30% of the women in the army are black, um, enlisted women, it's going to be more discrimination for gender and, and uh, sex. But, you know, I wouldn't want to have to put numbers, but I just think that, you know, there's a critical mass. Um, and, you know, legally, you can't discriminate, but you know, you can still not want women in. I don't know if they answered your question very articulately, but all right. Okay, ne next question, Barbara. Hey, this is Barb Kaharchek in South Carolina. Barb. Yeah, my video stuff's not working. Okay. Um, but uh, I, I have a question, but I'd like to comment on the previous question, being retired uh, military, and my time in the military was a go. I retired in 98. But I can tell you that as an officer, I did not see another Black female officer um, until I went to uh, squadron officer school. So that I was in the field. Then I was on, on Okinawa in my assignments. Very few. I did not see... Um, a senior ranking black female until about three years before I retired. Um, and we were uh, co-squadron commanders in the, in the training wing at um, Shepherd in Wichita Falls, Texas. So um, interestingly enough, that's Air Force, of course, I'm only speaking Air Force. And I think probably um, I'm talking off the top of my head, but I feel as though the a percentage of African-American women or women of color, not just African-American, but, uh, but Asian and uh, Latinx in the um, Air Force may be lower than it is in some other services, namely the Army. Um, it, so uh, my, my experience with discrimination as a woman existed. Yes, certainly it did, particularly in the, in the early years when I was young enough and um, not brave enough to stand up to anybody <laughs> much as a baby lieutenant. Um, but it still existed even when I retired in 1998, as Beth Ann mentioned, in very subtle ways sometimes, um, more subtle as the, as the effort to begin to address um, uh, harassment issues. Uh, became a little bit more to the fore. Um, my question, my real question is, Beth, are you going to post uh, someplace a link to the recording? I've got three or four um, friends who tried to get on and for whatever reason couldn't. And so if you're going to post the recording of this, that would be great. I can send that to them. Okay. Yes, we are. Uh, two places on the Facebook page, the Special Collections University Archives. Don't quite know how this works, but um, face, since this is Facebook Live, we'll record it there, and we'll also put it up on the YouTube, our YouTube channel. So yes, sorry about the technical. Okay, so this if you don't our... do Facebook and you don't do YouTube, how do you get access to it? Because I don't do either. 
<laughs> okay, well, that, that's fine. Um, Facebook, you have to join, but YouTube is just a site. So it's just a link. You would click on it and the video would start playing. So Yeah, but I mean, how am I going to get the link? Is that going to be put out? Right. I will. Uh, through the alumni group or something? I don't know. I will send it out to everyone. Oh, I see. I got it. Somebody. Yeah, St it. Stacy just posted it. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's good. I can, I'll just copy that. Great. Right. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, Barb. Good yeah. to talk to you. Yeah. Okay. I think we have time for one last question. If anyone has one. Okay. Or if not, we can um, thank Beth Ann for a wonderful presentation. And I also want to invite everyone to SCUA's next presentation for our 50th anniversary speaker series. And that will be um, given by Stacey Krem, the curator of our manuscripts um, and assistant professor, and William Nelson, who is our cello music cataloger and associate professor at UNCG. And that presentation will be a conversation of note curators talk about the history of UNCG's cello music collection on March 14th, 2022. So we hope to see you there. And so thank you, everyone. Knocking that technical problems out of the music. <laughs> so thank you, everybody, for your patience. Thanks for attending. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.